So welcome everybody to the BioExcel webinar number 74. Today with us is Giovanni Bussi from Scuola Internazionale Superiore di Studi Avanzati, also well known as CISA in Trieste. And he will speak about temperature pressure control, uh, in particular a first order stochastic algorithm. And I am Alessandra Villa, and I host this webinar together with Otto Anderson, and we are from the Center of Excellence for Computational Biomolecular Research. The webinar is being recorded, so you are aware of that. And after the webinar, if you still have some question, you can join and you can interact with uh, Giovanni using appsbioxcel.eu forum. There you will find the category dedicated to the webinar, to the Bioxcel webinar, and you will find the webinar number 74. That is the one that Bus Giovanni Bussi is giving now. And now something about Giovanni. So Giovanni got uh, his PhD from the University of Modena in Reggio Emilia, in particular was working on a British ab initial computation. After that, he joined the group of Parinello in Zurich, and he started to work on biomolecular system and molecular simulation. Then uh, he moved uh, finally in uh, at TISA, and since 2020, he got the position of full professor. And CISA, he was starting a group on the simulation of nucleic acid. He got several grants, among others, uh, ER6 starting grant, an important national, Italian national grant. And is one of the developer of the open source package Plume. On the top of this, he's also interested in the development of fundamental algorithm for molecular dynamic simulation. And that is the reason why he's today here to speak about thermostat and barostat. So now I stop sharing and I give the word to Giovanni, please. Okay, can you hear me? I should be sharing now. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, it's great. So uh, thank you, Alessandra, for the very nice introduction. And thank you to both of you for uh, um, arranging this uh, very interesting and I hope useful series of uh, uh, seminars, of webinars. So today I will talk about temperature and pressure control using uh, uh, first order stochastic algorithms. So let me start with some uh, motivation. So, uh, so this is a Gromax community mostly. So I imagine most of the people here are working simulating solvated biomolecules, even though it might be not all of you. Uh, so when you simulate solvated biomolecules, typically you would like to have molecules at a very low concentration, so in a very large volume. Uh, but you cannot do that because it's too expensive. And so what you do is uh, you simulate a much smaller volume with periodic boundary conditions, right? But when you do so, then the size of the system that you are simulating is, uh, uh, is very small, so fluctuations start to matter. And uh, typically, you want to be able to make this very little system that you're able to simulate, communicate with the outer world and to exchange heat. And that's what you, you do using uh, thermostats or work. And that's uh, what you do using barostats, so mechanical work. So in order to do so, uh, you have to run your simulation in a uh, well-defined and controlled ensemble. So the case, the case of an isolated system where the number of particles is fixed, the volume is fixed and the energy is fixed. So there's no interaction with the outer world is that of the, that of the microcanonical or MBE ensemble. And you can simulate that using the Hamilton equations. But if you want to model in some way energy exchange with the rest of the world, you have to add a thermostat and you end up in the MVT or canonical ensemble. And similarly, if you want to model exchange of mechanical work, you have to add a barostat so that your volume will be allowed to change. And this is usually done in a setting where both energy and volume are allowed to change, which is this NPT ensemble. In addition, you might also have a number of particles changing. And remember, if you have a non-homogeneous system, clearly you could, should specify which type of particles are changing. So you could control the chemical potential instead of the number of particles for 
one or more of the species that are in your simulation. And often this is done by combining uh, molecular dynamics with Monte Carlo, but this is something kind of more advanced and more complicated to do. So today I will focus on basically these two cases, which is the MVT or isothermal ensemble and the MPT, which is the isothermal isobaric ensemble. So this is my agenda for today. I will have two sections. First, I will discuss thermostats and we'll give some introduction and then focus on one specific algorithm, which is stochastic velocity rescaling. And then I will discuss barostats. And again, we'll give you some introduction on the topic. And then I will discuss the stochastic cell rescaling barostat, both in its isotropic and anisotropic version. And I'm happy to take questions also in the middle of the presentation if you think it makes sense. So, uh, or you can just wait to the end as you prefer. So, uh, so when you uh, simulate a system which is isolated, uh, you typically solve the Hamilton equations and uh, you typically use them like integrators like uh, leapfrog or velocity verde. So uh, the idea here is that if the time step, the integration time step is chosen small enough, you will sample exactly from the MVE or microcanonical ensemble, which has this expression for the probability to extract a given set of configurations and velocities. Now, a thermostat is basically a modification of these equations of motion. So you don't solve anymore the Hamilton equation, but you add something to the evolution of uh, positions and or velocities in order to sample from this ensemble instead. You see where basically the probability is, pro is equal to an exponential of minus the energy of the configuration divided by KBT. So I said that you could modify the equation of motion for the positions. This is possible, actually. This is done with so-called configurational thermostats. So in configurational thermostats, you modify the velocity in some way, the, sorry, the rate at which the positions are changed. Uh, I, I wanted to mention this because this is a special case that is often ignored. Uh, even though these algorithms are not very popular, uh, but uh, still, I think it's worth to know that it's possible to do so. Uh, on the other hand, most of the algorithms used to control temperature are acting on the directly on the evolution of the velocity. So they are kinetic thermostats. I would say all the other thermostats except for this very uh, special selection. And uh, I ubiquitously used. And again, uh, actually, I think this is a very interesting topic, uh, but today I will focus on uh, kinetic thermostats. Then you have another distinction that you should make, which is between local and global thermostats. Examples of local thermostats are listed here, like uh, Langevin equation, Anderson, massive, Nose Hoover, dissipative particle dynamics. In all these cases, you add a force to each particle, which is independent to some extent to the force that you add to the other particles. Every particle is thermalized independently of the other ones. On the other hand, in global thermostats, you basically control all the particles simultaneously. So one way of seeing global thermostat is to say that you have a friction, a single friction. You see it's not depending on the index I, which acts the same friction on every atom of your system. And this friction could be time dependent. Another way of seeing this algorithm is that basically at every step, you scale all the velocities by the same multiplicative factor. So what's the, the, the important difference between these two types of uh, thermostats? So uh, the global thermostats, so uh, local thermostats thermalize also in absence of collision. So imagine that you have a simulation box like this with two subset of particles. Some of them are hot in the sense that they are moving very quick, quickly. Some of them are moving more slowly. Uh, and the, a global thermostat would, would sense the total kinetic energy that perhaps is fine. A, a local thermostat would find that these particles are too slow and will thermalize them separately from these particles. So if you have a system that could be decomposed as some system with very poor interactions, typically a local thermostat is a much more robust choice. Clearly it could be more difficult than this where you have some degrees of freedom that are not very well coupled with other degrees of freedom. Uh, instead with global thermostat, you will have to assume that collisions between particles are sufficient to basically lead to equipartition. However, there are also other in, uh, differences. So uh, importantly, uh, the effect on dynamics of uh, global thermostat is much smaller than the effect on dynamics of local thermostats. And uh, this can be seen uh, in this figure. Uh, 
or some specific choice of global and local thermostat, but you see as a function of the control parameter, tau of the thermostat, you see the diffusion constant. It's basically independent of the choice of the parameter, the diffusion coefficient for a global thermostat, whereas for a local thermostat, if you choose a too high friction in this case, you end up in a very low diffusion constant. So dynamics is severely affected by local thermostats. And in addition, and this is more qualitative and uh, probably a system dependent statement, it has been seen that global thermostats are much more efficient to equilibrate condensed phases. So unless you are in a system where you have many particles which are really decoupled, so if everyone is interacting with everyone in some way, usually global thermostats are much more efficient. So one way to understand this smaller impact on dynamic is uh, by looking at this graph, you can imagine your momentum as a high dimensional vector. If you have 100 particles, it would be 300 dimensional vector. And uh, let's say that at some point, uh, the value of the momentum vector lies here. Uh, applying a local thermostat would bring the momentum vector anywhere, could move it to anywhere else. Uh, whereas uh, for a global thermostat, you would only move it in this direction. So the change in the momentum will be proportional to the momentum itself. So this would amount actually in a scaling operation on the momentum vector. And remember, it's a scaling done in very high dimensionality. So imagine this in dimensionality 300. So you move in one direction and you do not move in 299 directions. So you basically remove all the change in, uh, in um, velocities that lead to transfer of energy between particles and only keep the change in energy that leads to a change in the global kinetic energy. That's what you do with the global thermostat. So how, how are they implemented? So basically all global thermostats can be implemented in this way. You just evolve Hamilton equations without thermostat. You compute the kinetic energy. You propagate the kinetic energy, and that's what, uh, what's done in a different way for depending on the thermostat you are using. And then you rescale the momenta with a factor that depends on the new kinetic energy and the old kinetic energy, basically to achieve a new value of the kinetic energy. Then here you find a table with some example. So uh, um, velocity rescaling, Berenson, uh, they are deterministic schemes. Uh, they are here in red because they are well known for uh, uh, reporting um, ensemble, an ensemble which is not canonical. So you don't basically obtain the correct fluctuations using these schemes. All these schemes uh, return the correct fluctuations. Some of them are stochastic, some of them are deterministic. And I will particularly focus on this one, which is stochastic and first order. So what do I mean with first order? So let's have a look at how the kinetic energy is propagated in this stochastic velocity rescaling scheme. So this is the increment that you expect in the kinetic energy given by the thermostat. So you see there is a restoring term that brings the kinetic energy towards its target value. This KB, K bar will be just the three half number of atoms KBT, typically. Uh, this is actually, this term is identical to the one that you have in the Berenson thermostat, which is also first order, but uh, is missing this stochastic term. You have a single tuning parameter, which is this tau t that controls how quickly the thermostat will force your system to relax towards the correct average energy. But importantly, you have an additional term here, which is stochastic, and that uh, is able to enforce the right fluctuations. And here you just have to plug in the number of degrees of freedom of the system, and everything else is, is defined. So uh, this equation is nice because this part is uh, equivalent to the well-known and the uh, widely used Berenson thermostat, and this part uh, reconciles the correct uh, fluctuations. Another nice thing is that this equation, even if it looks a bit complicated, can be solved analytically, uh, which means that you can uh, exactly draw a new kin random kinetic energy corresponding to having propagated this equation. So you don't need to do use complicated multiple time stepping algorithms to integrate the thermostat itself. So why is it in interesting and uh, useful to have a first order thermostat uh, which gives uh, correct fluctuation? So the traditional pipeline, the suggested protocol for many years has been to do like equilibration using Berenson thermostat, which uh, doesn't give correct fluctuations, but on the other hand, equilibrates very well. Uh, and then uh, you do production using something like uh, 
no the Hoover thermostat, perhaps something which typically is second order and give you the correct actuation. Having a first order algorithm that can be used both for equilibration and production, it's very convenient. It makes the this little detail that nobody wants to care about, which is the choice of the thermostat, a little easier to choose. So how can we see this uh, uh, thermostat uh, in action and how does it compare with other uh, possible choices? So this comes from a quite old paper. This is where we introduced this scheme. Uh, these uh, simulations are done with DL Poly. Uh, this is for a Leonard Jones solid and for a Leonard Jones liquid. And here what I report is as a function of the tuning parameter, this tau. I report the value of the fluctuation of the kinetic energy or of the potential energy for different schemes. So you see basically that with the Berenson scheme, the fluctuations are depending on the choice of tau. So depending on how you choose the tau parameter, you will get a different result. That's not good and it's well known. Actually, the fluctuations are, are too small in both cases. Uh, the Nose Hoover scheme is supposed to give correct fluctuations. Uh, and it does so in a wide range of values of, of tau. For instance, you see here, it does reasonably well. When tau is very small, however, it has troubles. And uh, I, I guess this is actually due to the way uh, this has been uh, technically implemented in the poly. But the fact is that the equations of motion for the Nose Hoover uh, cannot be integrated exactly. So you have to so find out how to integ integrate them. And for some choice of tau, uh, you, you have to be very careful in not introducing integration errors. For a solid, there's something interesting that happens. Even for very large tau, you have artifacts with the Nose Hoover thermostat. And this is something which is also widely known that the Nose Hoover thermostat is not working properly for a harmonic oscillator. And so solids, which can be to some extent described as harmonic oscillators, uh, in some regime of the choice of the parameters, uh, uh, give problematic results, say. Uh, this is a similar test uh, done for ice and water, where you see uh, where the system is maybe a bit more relevant and uh, you, you see a very similar behavior. Uh, and also here, you see that for a large value of tau, basically with the Nose Hoover thermostat, you could end up in, uh, in uh, um, incorrect values of the fluctuations. We can also look for dynamics. I mentioned this already quickly. In, in this analysis, we took this trajectory for ice and for water. So for ice, we computed the vibrational density of states, just, just the Fourier transform of the velocity autocorrelation function. And you see that if you run without a thermostat, that's a solid line or, the, or with this stochastic velocity rescaling with very different settings, you basically get the same, uh, the same properties. And the same is, is true for the uh, diffusion um, coefficient. Basically, you get values which are very close to those that you obtain using a, a simulation without a thermostat. Actually, this is not a specific property of stochastic velocity rescaling. The fact that um, dynamic is largely unaffected is a property of all global thermostats. As I explained, it's because they are designed to minimize the impact on the trajectory. And actually the reason why you see this is that there are many atoms. So if you imagine to apply a global thermostat to a system with five atoms, you will see a lot of impact on the, on the dynamics. And another important thing is that we are monitoring properties that are very different from what the thermostat is acting on. The thermostat is acting directly on the kinetic energy. If you look at the dynamics of the kinetic energy, it will be very different with the thermostat or without. But if you look at local properties, they will typically be not much affected by global thermostats in general. Okay, a common question, at least in the past, has been what about flying ice cube? So this is an effect that was detected many years ago. It's an artifact that comes out with velocity rescaling and with, uh, with Berenson. And uh, basically you can visualize it as uh, your system uh, completely freezing and uh, where all the energy goes into the center of mass. But in a more subtle way, you can see that basically the equipartition is not achieved. So different degrees of freedom have different uh, amount of energy. So in this work, you can see a comparison of uh, uh, different schemes. And you can see that uh, uh, basically uh, Langevin, Nose Hoover Chain, also stochastic velocity rescaling, they all provide correct uh, equipartition. And the problem is, so is not related to the scaling itself, but to the way the scaling is done. So the problem only appears for Berenson and for simple velocity rescaling. Uh, another uh, uh, 
uh, I think uh, interesting question is who, who cares about the fluctuation? So of course, if we are computing the fluctuation, this is important, but let's say we are computing something else. Should we be careful about the fluctuations? So this is another paper, uh, paper by the group of Gerhard Hummer, 2008. So here they only compared no thermostat, Berenson thermostat and Langevin thermostat, uh, different fluctuations in the potential energy that's known and expected. But what was kind of unexpected is that if you apply this thermostat in a TRMD simulation, you will get incorrect results in terms of looking at the fraction of folded protein that you have in your uh, system as a function of the temperature. So uh, this, I think, is very interesting because it means that uh, there is an indirect effect only on properties that uh, you might believe to be sort of independent of, of these fluctuations. And actually, even if this paper is, was published like just one year after our paper, uh, the, the reason why I started to work on this topic is exactly this. I was playing with replica exchange. I, I found out that the results with velocity rescaling were wrong. And, uh, and uh, Michele, my, my, my supervisor told me, ah, let's try to fix the, the thermostat because I was using the real poly and there was this velocity rescaling. I fixed the thermostat and the, the artifacts went away. And then we realized, ah, okay, this, there is a, this is a very nice way of fixing velocity rescaling thermostat to make it produce correct results. So actually all these problems are related to the violation of the tail balance. Uh, can we quantify how much our trajectory is violating the tail balance? So uh, uh, this is the, the flow chart that we have. So we first evolve our trajectory using Hamilton equations. So if this is done with a small enough time step, energy will change very little. This energy change is actually violating the tail balance. So it is incorrect. It should be zero. It's not. We have to accept a finite time step. On the other hand, when we propagate the kinetic energy, if we can solve our differential equation exactly, and we can for our thermostat, then the energy will change a lot because possibly you will have a large scaling factor, but this will not violate the tail balance. So there's something that is explained in detail in, in the paper, such that you can basically sum all the energy increments that are coming out from the evolution of the Hamilton equations or in other words, subtract from the energy, all the energy changes given by the thermostat and obtain some effective energy that is like energy of the system plus energy of the bath that allows you to monitor how much are violating the tail balance. Let me show this in practice. Again, this is a Leonard Jones liquid. Uh, so uh, lots are just shifted for clarity. This is uh, energy conservation in a NVE simulation, no thermostat, and this is, effective energy conservation using the thermostat. And you see it behaves very, very similarly. You have no systematic drift or very little drift maybe and uh, small fluctuations. If you go to a very large and definitely incorrect for this system time step, you will see that energy will drift up. So you see at the beginning of this plot, the two simulations behave similarly. Then of course, when the energy becomes too large, there are feedbacks and so the system does something strange and at some point it explodes. Whereas with a, with a thermostat, we just have a constant drift that you can measure and you can use to assess your integration errors. So that's why this effective, you can define a sort of effective energy that includes the energy of the thermal bath. And actually these formulas can be used to define the effective energy also for Langevin thermostat, you can do it for Nose Hoover. If you do so, you end up in what's traditionally been used as conserved energy for the Nose Hoover thermostat. And uh, for balancing, you cannot do it because the algorithm per se is not uh, time reversible. So this algorithm has been published in 2007 and now it's, it's uh, widely available in many MD codes. Uh, the names are different. So you have this, this CSVR in LAMPS and CP2K. Sometimes it's called BUSI or BUSI Donadio Parinello or BDP, it's available in Gromax, and this is T coupling equal to V rescale, where you can also use it uh, uh, coupling separate groups independently. And uh, if you want to implement it yourself, uh, there's some function here that could be useful. And then to summarize this part, uh, I try to uh, explain the difference between local and uh, global thermostats, why global thermostats are interesting. And uh, uh, I introduced stochastic velocity rescaling, which is a global uh, first order. So it equilibrates fast and in a predictable way. 
It gives correct fluctuations, uh, allows you to monitor energy conservation, and it's easy to tune and to implement. And then if there are questions on this part, maybe I'm happy to take them now. So if someone has any question, just put in the Q&A, I have a question and we will unmute you. So you can just at this moment ask question on the thermostat, please. We just give a couple of minutes, maybe people has to think about. Okay, so we have a question from Khan. I will unmute him if it's possible. Let's see. I permit Khan, you can speak if you want. No? Okay, so I will read the, I will read the question. Could a stochastic thermostat relative to a strictly deterministic one generate more entropy in a fluid or in a gaseous phase, biasing the system toward more fluctuation? I mean, not in absolute terms, but only by proportionality to the system enthalpy as well. Oh, so, sorry, proportionally to the system enthalpy. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would say uh, for a liquid, I would say no. Uh, it should not depend on the fact that the thermostat is deterministic or uh, or stochastic. Uh, for a gaseous system, the real answer is I don't know. So basically, I, I'm very suspicious that any global thermostat could work very poorly in a gaseous system. Okay, thank you. So now we have William. I allowed you to speak, William. If you want, you can speak. This is about MPT simulation. So maybe it's later. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I arrived a little bit late and I um, I missed the first part. But I have a, a question about the settings to use and with a low pressure simulation. We've been fighting with this for some time and we don't know. We can't get anything to work, even for NPT. We really like to do uh, thermodynamic integration, but even NPT doesn't give the correct densities. Uh, could we take this, uh, sorry, William, could we take it after the barostat part? Of course, of course. Yeah, uh, so I will unmute you later. Thank you. Okay. So now we have uh, Niti Sangar. I just unmute you. Maybe I can read it. Is, you, is can, the uh, you can speak it now. You can speak if you want. No, you can read it. Yeah, I, I will read it. Is the drift only because of high delta t? Uh, yes, in the sense that uh, as delta t tends to zero, the drift will disappear. So that's uh, guaranteed unless there is a bug in your implementation. This is also a very useful uh, test. So someone further, someone asking if we can have the Git up link. And yeah, maybe course, Giovanni uh, you, can yeah. put in the chat so everybody can see it. Yeah, actually, I will share the PDF of and, the slides uh, afterwards. So there is a question, I mean, a split and implicit solvent. Just give me a, quest, a moment that I will try to unmute Eric. So he has a chance to, to, to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you for the talk and thank you for the thermostat. We, we've used this a lot in our work. Um, so my question is, when working with, everything here has kind of been about solvated stuff and explicit solvent. How about global rescaling for implicit solvents? Is that still recommended or do you need those local thermostats to try to capture some of the solvent effects when doing production runs in implicit solvent? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. In that case, typically people would use like Langevin dynamics. It's not used as a thermostat, but used like to model collision with water, as you said. So if you want to capture correct dynamics, definitely you need to do so. But if you think about it, you should do, you should do so in a smart way. Like, I don't know, maybe surface atoms should feel different collisions than the inner atoms in your large protein. So it's tricky to reproduce this properly. Then the, the, maybe another a related point is for a system which is not uh, solvated, would uh, uh, a global thermostat be uh, efficient? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I have no really no direct experience. So the best thing is to try, try and 
check. There are, I've seen several papers recently trying to check also equilibration of individual degrees of freedom with the global thermostat. It's possible that you are in corner cases where uh, some degrees of freedom will not be properly equilibrated with a global thermostat. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. And I will suggest uh, that we go on. We have Luis that has oh, wait, there is another question on the thermostat. Uh, yeah, if you okay, if you could you repeat uh, what you say using thermostat for a gas system phase? Actually, I have no experience with simulation of uh, gas phase systems, and uh, I would say that global thermostats are probably not uh, very uh, not a good idea in this case. Okay, thank you very much, Giovanni. Please now we go to the barostat. Okay, let's go to Barostat now. So uh, here we start with our equations uh, with thermostats. And, uh, uh, but now we also want to allow an um, exchange of work with the uh, outer world. So to do so, we need to add the, the volume as a dynamic variable and uh, the distribution that we will sample from will look like this, this is the uh, isobaric distribution. And basically, you will have to add some rules to propagate the volume, and in addition to modify the rules that you use to propagate positions and velocities, including barostat depending uh, terms here. So, uh, what does the what is what the barostat expected to do on the coordinates? So clearly, the barostat has to change the volume. It could do nothing to the coordinates, but this could be very ineffective. Why? Because particles that are close to the boundary of your box would. Uh, we have a very large dis so distances which are across the boundaries of your box with periodic boundary conditions would feel very large change when you scale, when you change the volume and other distances would be not affected. So the, the most conventional, the, the most common thing is to basically scale all the coordinates um, with the same factor, which is basically the cubic root of the change in the volume. Then should you do something to velocities as well? This is kind of optional. And uh, I would say in most cases, velocities are scaled with an inverse factor, but this is not strictly required and we will see a bit more details. So uh, actually, and uh, this detail is related to what you want to define as the internal pressure of the system. So imagine when you operate this scaling, when, when you do this scaling operation, the energy of the system changes and the, the definition of the internal pressure is minus the derivative of the energy change with respect to the volume. So what you do when you change the volume uh, affects what you're going to obtain as a definition for the internal pressure. For instance, if you scale coordinates and then velocities with an inverse factor, as I said, and that's what's done in, the, has been done originally in the Andersen uh, Barostat, but uh, also in, in most other algorithms it's done like this. Basically your definition of the in internal pressure will look like this. Uh, if you instead, Instead, only scale the coordinates, and this is something not very common. I've seen this in a paper only, uh, or this is what is done usually in uh, uh, Monte Carlo uh, barostats. Uh, you, instead of using the kinetic energy for this contribution, for the ideal gas contribution, you use its average value. It's a subtle detail, but remember, we are trying to reproduce corrective fluctuations. So these subtle details are very important. And actually, this is not the only choice. You have other choices. You could decide, for instance, to take the derivative of the energy, just scaling the center of your molecules, but without changing the internal distances in your molecule. This is convenient, for instance, if you have a system with, uh, with the rigid constraints. And I think this is, if I remember correctly, this is what's implemented by default in the AMBER code. And in that case, you should include only the kinetic energy of the center of mass of your molecules or the number of molecules only in this entropic factor. And also the, the virial will be, term will be computed differently. So how do you implement then barostat in practice? So you evolve your Hamilton equations, you apply a thermostat, and then you have to compute the internal pressure and use it to propagate the volume. And then once you decide what's the value of the new volume, you should scale the positions and optionally, as we said, scale the velocities. And again, you have many options. This is a list of the most popular ones. I already mentioned you can use Monte Carlo to propagate the volume. Uh, you have the Berenson scheme, which is, uh, again, not uh, producing correct fluctuation, but it's very efficient because it's a first order. So it relaxes directly to the point. 
And then you have uh, uh, several other choices uh, among which uh, the other one, which is first order is stochastic server scaling. And now I will go into the details uh, of this. So uh, this is the equation that you will use to propagate your volume. So it, it looks very similar to what you have in the Behrens and Barostat. There is a restoring term, which depends on the difference between the external pressure, which is a control parameter. You set it in the input file and the internal pressure, which is computed based on coordinates and possibly velocities. And uh, you have a prefactor in front that uh, you see it depends on this tau p, which is your tuning parameter that tells you how quickly you want to relax your volume. But there's also another term here, which is the an S where you should plug the uh, estimate of the isothermal compressibility of the system. You see that, uh, which basically depends on how the volume changes uh, when you change the pressure. So you, you typically don't know it a priori, but you could estimate it. So, and you see that in this equation, you only have beta t divided by tau p and also here beta t divided by tau p. So basically only the ratio matter. It's a single parameter, but the typical way of choosing it is to fix beta t with some estimate and then choose tau p depending on how quickly you want your system to relax. So one very important thing to notice is that uh, whereas the equation for the thermostat could be integrated analytically, this one cannot be integrated analytically because p int depends on the volume in a very non-trivial way. You change a bit the volume, the energy changes because you have particles getting a different distance. You cannot predict this in any way. So this equation cannot be integrated exactly. This is an important distinction. So still you can implement it. And here I will show you some tests. These were done much more recently, 2020 with Gromax. Uh, this is uh, uh, also uh, uh, this is, um, uh, liquid water. 3,000 molecules, more or less. Here you see with Parinello Raman, which is supposed to give the correct fluctuations, stochastic server scaling, and Berenson. Here you have the average value of the volume as a function of the control parameter, tau p. And here you have the fluctuation volume as a function of the control parameter, tau p. You basically see that the Berenson Barostat gives you proper average, but underestimate fluctuations. Stochastic velocity rescaling gives correct fluctuation on a wide range. Parinello Raman here, it's failing at very small tau p, but again, I suspect this could depend on uh, also on the way it's uh, uh, the, the details of the implementation of the integration of this. So uh, there is one important comment about this beta t, the estimate of the isothermal compressibility. You can actually compute this isothermal compressibility by running a short simulation in the MPT ensemble and looking at the fluctuations of the volume, but typically you don't know this in advance. So this is in the case of Leonard Jones, we could estimate it well, it's around 0 0.3 in its uh, unitless. And uh, then if you look at the autocorrelation function of the volume for different choices of tau p, it decays basically as an exponential with the proper uh, uh, time scale tau p. So clearly at uh, large tau p, it decays slowly, at uh, small tau p, it decays more quickly. Now, what happens with water? This is interesting because everyone, I guess everyone using Gromax finds this comment saying that uh, the uh, isothermal compressibility of water is 4.5 times 10 to the minus five bar to the minus one and use that in the input file. That's actually the compressibility of real water, not of tip 3 p the, the, real, the compressibility of T3P is 6.3, it's larger. So the isothermal compressibility. And as a result of that, if you run a simulation with the Berenson Barostat or with the stochastic um, um, cell rescaling Barostat, you will find that the volume will relax at a different speed. Actually, you can make a change of timescales like this. It's roughly 50% slower the decaying. And after you make this change of time scale and overlap the autocorrelation function with the decaying exponential, you see very good agreement, you see? So basically, if you make a mistake in estimating the compressibility of the system in advance, you will basically make a mistake in how uh, you predict the relaxation of the volume will be. Another interesting thing that you can notice here is that if you make tau p very small, basically the volume will not have time to relax as quickly as the exponential would predict. Why is this happening? This is just the dynamics of the volume, but you have to imagine that when you change the volume, particles have to rearrange. If you do it too quickly, particles will not have the time to rearrange and the volume will not be able to relax so quickly. 
Uh, what about the integration of the equations of motion? This is more, this is complicated. Uh, exactly because uh, the, there's not an exact way to, in, to integrate the equation of motion for V. So in, in this work, we tested multiple different uh, implementations. In particular, all of them are tested on this educational code that you can find at this GitHub uh, link. And um, uh, here you can see, again, average value of the volume for different value of tau P and for different integrators. And all these integrators will fail at some point if tau P is chosen too small. And uh, these are the fluctuations. And again, you see they are compatible between each other, except that they will all fail if tau p is chosen too small. And this is the energy drift, this effective energy. In this case, similarly to before, you can quantify the tail balance violation. And this is the drift per step as a function of tau p. You see that the smaller tau p, the larger this drift. Notice that the curve here is missing for the Euler integrator. The Euler integrator is the one that is easy to implement. It's actually the only one that we managed to implement in Gromax, but formally is not reversible. So formally, you should not define a, a, a effective energy. Uh, on the other hand, the properties of, uh, of the system, like average fluctuations are compatible between these integrators. So we thought, okay, it's fine. It's, it would be difficult to implement these integrators properly within Gromma, so we will only implement the Euler one. So similarly to the case of the thermostat, one could uh, ask, so, uh, okay, obviously if I'm interested in volume fluctuations, yes, they should uh, be computed properly, but let's say that I'm interested in computing the free energy difference. So there's this, this interesting paper. This is a very extensive benchmark. Uh, from a series of papers, this is a sample six, uh, where they did comparison of uh, free energy calculations using alchemical methods. And uh, in particular, they compare results obtained with Gromax using the Berenson, Barostat, and uh, um, OpenMM using Monte Carlo Barostat. And they've seen kind of significant difference around 2.5 kJ per mole. So uh, we try to reproduce this. Uh, using uh, uh, Gromax, and we actually have seen no basically no difference between uh, Berens and uh, stochastic server scaling and uh, Parinello Raman. No difference in the free energies. Actually, difference in volume fluctuations, but no difference in free energies. So we were not able to reproduce the discrepancy. So I suspect that the difference that they report could be due to some other differences between Open uh, MM and Gromax, and not to the Barostat. So, uh, so my uh, uh, take home message for this is that uh, if you compute free energies with Berenson or even with MVT, possibly they would be correct, or at least I didn't find any compelling example to show you that you need to use the proper Barostat to compute free energies. Uh, of course, the answer might be system dependent. So you have to be careful, of course. Uh, and, and again, as a side story, it was actually when this preprint came out, it was, I think, 2019, that I thought, uh, okay, if really there is this problem with the Berenson and Barostat, we should find a way to fix it. And actually, I, I had, like in my drawer, since five years, the equations for the Barostat. So that's how the old thing restarted in 2019. So uh, this Barostat can also be implemented in a semi-isotropic formulation. We did this in the, in the first paper. Here, basically, you can uh, separately control the uh, length, the, the height of the box and the area of the base of the box. This can be very useful, especially to simulate uh, membranes or interfaces in general. And uh, uh, in particular, you can also control the surface tension. So you can sample from the so-called MP gamma T ensemble. Uh, we did some tests to make sure things are kind of reasonable. We obtained fluctuations which are compatible with the Parinello Raman implementation and uh, and as a negative control, we have that Berenson predicts uh, significantly lower fluctuations. So we were happy, but uh, also I'm not really an expert of these types of systems. So I would be happy to receive feedbacks from people that try this on other interfaces. Uh, you can make your life even more complicated if you want to study uh, periodic uh, solids like crystals, because here you would need to take into account the full box shape. So you would have nine degrees of freedom to change, not just one, not just the volume, but the full, the three vector that generates the periodic lattice. So uh, the, the pioneering work in, in, uh, in this field was a work indeed by Parinelle Raman, where they proposed a way to uh, 
uh, simulate these uh, cell shape fluctuations uh, at uh, proper temperature. Uh, there are other algorithms in the literature. Uh, gra actually, Gromax uh, uh, only implements Parinellorama. So, and so we at, at, at some point we said, okay, can we generalize our equations to the fully flexible anisotropic case? And the answer is yes. So you can, you obtain similar equations uh, where you have again like a balance and like restoring term. Here the internal pressure becomes uh, uh, actually a stress tensor, and you you are able to apply either a external hydrostatic pressure or an external stress. And again, you will need uh, uh, the proper noise to be added in order to get the right uh, fluctuations. So uh, here we run some comparison. Uh, this was done using Gromax. As I said, Gromax only implements Parinello-Raman for the fully anisotropic case. And here you see that, uh, so here trajectories are shifted for clarity, but uh, so the averages are actually equal to each other, but you see that fluctuations in the Parinello-Raman are really equilibrating very slowly. And I don't know if this is due to the Parinello Raman equations or to the way they are implemented in Chromax. I really have no idea. And uh, in, in the isotropic case, we were able to compare with also with the MTTK, which is Martina, Tobias, Stackerman, Klein, Barostat, which is available only in the isotropic case, which gives results very similar to our uh, stochastic cell rescaling approach. Uh, these are autocorrelation functions for different value of tau and also comparing results obtained with Gromax and uh, lamps. So uh, the, the message here is that basically the stochastic cell rescaling here as always like this nice exponential like decaying. So the volume will always relax in an exponential way. Whereas other algorithms will have fluctuations that uh, could that where they could be dumped in a different time scale and they could also have a different period, depending on how you set up the, the algorithm. Uh, as I mentioned, you can also uh, apply an external stress. So this is an example with gold, where we apply an external stress uh, to see uh, deformation in the unit cell until the system at some point breaks, and you see a slip here. And then we were able to test these different implementation, different bar stats, and also static calculations to to validate that we are obtaining correct results. So uh, what about uh, availability? So for the isotropic and semi-isotropic versions, uh, they are basically available in Gromax uh, 2021 app. So this is just the keyword, zero scale. Uh, for the anisotropic version, we did this work uh, using a custom modified version of Gromax 2021. And so we distribute a patch if you want to use it. And we have now ongoing the review of a merge request on the master branch. So this, this implementation for the fully anisotropic case could appear in a later Gromax version. Then to summarize this uh, uh, second part, uh, I introduced to you Barstat and uh, in particular stochastic cell rescaling. It's a uh, first order, it gives right fluctuations. It has uh, one parameter, actually apparently two, but you've seen that only the ratio matters. Uh, you can define effective energy conservation, even though this requires to implement some non-trivial integrator and can be generalized to uh, crystalline solids. And finally, let me thank my collaborators for this work. This has been work done across decades. So the work on thermostats uh, uh, was done when I was still a postdoc in a group of uh, Michele Parinello. And I also want to acknowledge David and Donadio who was helping me a lot, uh, like teaching me how to simulate uh, water. Uh, the work on stochastic cell rescaling was done by a postdoc in my group, a former postdoc of my group, Mattia Bernetti, whereas the anisotropic version uh, was developed by a master student that was visiting my group, Vittorio Del Tatto, in collaboration with Paolo Raiteri from uh, Cartin. And then thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Giovanni. It was very nice and clear presentation. Now we go to William, that he had the question, so I will unmute William, so he can ask his question. Yeah, please, William, you are allowed. And uh, sorry, in the meantime, I will okay. ask everybody to write if you have a question on the Q and A. Okay, please. I just uh, unmuted myself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Uh, yes, actually, I think someone almost asked the same question earlier on. Uh, it's a, really we're trying to do simulations in the gas phase. 
we want to do NPT, and we also want to calculate chemical potentials, basically uh, by thermodynamic integration. And nothing seems to work. We, we, when we know the right answer, this is very low pressures, say uh, 100 pascals or something like that. Any suggestions? So my suggestion would be that if you are in the gas phase, so for the, but I'm really guessing. So sure. take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> Uh, what I would do is, uh, uh, if you want to compute thermodynamic quantities like chemical potential, I would suggest to use Langevin thermostat and to use still this stochastic cell rescaling thermostat, which should be stable uh, and should work well, even if you have a, a gas phase system. Because in the end, the volume is just one variable. Uh, right. Instead, for your particles, you cannot assume that they will be uh, coupled enough for a global thermostat to work. That's what I would guess. I'm sorry. So you could say the Langevin thermostat and what barostat? I would use, I would try this CRS scale barostat. What about a, a Monte Carlo barostat? We thought about that, but. Yeah, that should give a very similar result and would be equally good option, I would say. Uh, the main difference is the way you tune parameters. For Monte Carlo barostat, you typically set the step sides. For uh, right. this CRS scale, you typically set a, a relaxation time scale. But I would say, I would bet they would give very similar results. And they would have very similar efficiency, very similar properties. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have another question from Khan that I could not unmute before. So uh, you can read the question loudly, Giovanni. Yeah, should I read the question? Yeah, so could the Barostat cell rescaling steer the system from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, perhaps by creating the case which radically violate the Boltzmann distribution at set temperature. I don't think so. So uh, all these moves uh, are done at uh, equilibrium. So uh, provided that the tau p is not too small, in which case you ba basically will fail in the integration. I don't expect that the barostat will uh, induce violation of the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, thank you very much. Please, if there, anybody else has a question, please type in the Q&A. Okay, I don't see question appearing. So I will just... Uh, mm, so I, we just wait a moment if someone has another question. No, so I want just to copy. So if you have other questions that are popping up, you can always ask to Giovanni via the, the webinar link on the forum. So then now I will post it. I will post so you can see here you can go further to ask more questions to Giovanni. I put there all the questions that you have asked so Giovanni could also answer again in his written form. And I thank you everybody for the attendance. And I close this webinar section now and we will go back in spring. So the by Excel webinar for the winter are going on holiday and we will be back around February. Looking forward to see all of you again. Thank you very much for joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.